ഓം അജ്ഞാനത്തിമിരാന്ധസ് ജ്ഞാനാഞ്ജനശലാക്കയ ചക്ഷുരോന്മീലിതം തസ്മയ ശ്രീ ഗുരവേ നമഃ ശ്രീചൈതന്യ മനോഭീഷ്ടം സ്ഥാപിതം യേന ഭൂതലെ സ്വയം രൂപ കഥാ മഹ്യം ദാതി സ്വപദാന്തികം വന്ദേഹം ശ്രീ ഗുരു ശ്രീയുതപദകമലം ശ്രീ ഗുരുൻ വൈഷ്ണവാംശ്ച ശ്രീരൂപം സാഗ്രജാതം സഹഗണ്ഡരഘുനാഥാൻവിതം തം സജീവം സാദ്വൈതം സാവധൂതം പരിജനസഹിതം കൃഷ്ണചൈതന്യദേവം ശ്രീരാധാകൃഷ്ണപാദാം സഹഗണ്ഡലിത ശ്രീ വിശാഖാൻവിതാംശ്ച ജയ ശ്രീകൃഷ്ണചൈതന്യപ്രഭൂനിത്യാനന്ദ ശ്രീയദ്വൈതഗദാധർ ശ്രീവാസ് ആദിഗൗരഭക്തവൃന്ദ ഹരേ കൃഷ്ണ ഹരേ കൃഷ്ണ 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 ഹരി 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 രാമ ഹരി രാമ 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 ഹരി ഹരി എ വെരി വാം ഗുഡ് ഈവനിങ് ടു എവറി വൺ താങ്ക് യു ഫോർ കമ്മിങ് ഫോർ ദിസ് പ്രോഗ്രാം ഐ എം മൈൻഡ് ഫുൾ ദാറ്റ് വി ആർ സിറ്റിംഗ് ഹിയർ ഇൻ a scenic setting where i believe there is an organic farm where you come here to buy some organic produce and i was cautioned that the setting would be rather simple but i'm rather happy here is better to be in a simple situation than to be in something that isn't simplicity is happiness one of the keys to happiness is simplicity so my host were rather anxious that i might find it too simple but i think i'm happy with this and i'm sure you are too it's very interesting that the topic of happiness and mindfulness keeps coming up for the simple reason that we all want to be happy and that's not rocket science everyone understands that we all want to be happy but we want to do it in different ways someone thinks happiness can come by making money someone looks for happiness in sports someone in some intellectual endeavors we all have our different ways in which we think we can be happy however peace and happiness are very elusive phenomena in this world and i will share with you a few thoughts from the ancient wisdom books of the world specifically from where i come which is india there's a lot that is said about this ancient science of happiness yes happiness and peace is not something that can be whimsically attained you know for everything there is a protocol there's a method there is a process there's a science behind it driving a car cooking a meal setting up an industry or a factory growing a garden there's a science behind everything so why should there not be a science for being happy why should there not be a science for being peaceful but here in rise the problem what is happiness what is peace what is peace for you may not be peace for me there's some kind of music playing which may be peaceful to you may not be so for me something else may be good for me may not be good for you so it all seems so relative and also confusing is there some absolute standard of reference by which we can try to understand that there is something called peace which we can all strive for actually happiness is a state of mind period happiness is not in the external things of the world because external situations can be perceived differently by different people and people may have exactly opposite perceptions to the I- same identical situation i'd like to share with you two true stories which i heard about in both cases the situations were very close to each other very similar but the responses of the people involved were quite different 
there was one incident in which somebody I know or rather the somebody a friend of somebody I know who lost all his money his business collapsed he lost everything he was practically on the streets all that he had worked for for several years was all lost overnight because of some issues and he became so distraught that he committed suicide there are other instances I know of of people who are connected to those I know and also those we read about in the press and so on when confronted with failure when confronted with tragedy and catastrophe in their lives they can't cope with it and they take to uh, either some form of reclusive behavior or they develop psychological problems or they take refuge in such escapist tendencies as alcoholism or something like that so this is something that we all know we all see it happening perhaps once in a while we succumb to it maybe to some degree so this is one type of response when tragedy or failure strike us and there's another extreme the other opposite there was this one gentleman who had a flourishing business he was very very spiritually inclined and he had a habit of of a certain spiritual routine that he would do every morning he would wake up at a certain time in the early hours he would do his routine and then get on with his work he would never go to work until he had completed that routine one day as he was just about to embark on that daily routine he got news that the godown in which his merchandise was stored was on fire so naturally he rushed there and when he came there it was too late everything was ablaze it was a huge fire there was no way he could have done anything about it his people his employees had already called the fire brigade so very soon the fire brigade came there and they were trying their best to douse the fire because it was such a huge fire even the fire brigade had a hard time dealing with it and it wasn't about to get extinguished very soon so in the meanwhile as this gentleman this businessman was standing there looking at it all he surveyed the whole thing and went right back to perform his spiritual routine he just walked away from the spot and some other people who were there they, they looked at him in disbelief and they remonstrated with him and said look your, your entire life's business your wealth is just burning to ashes and you just want to walk away he said look what's happened is beyond my control I took all precautions to keep my merchandise safe and secure but by the will of providence destiny whatever you may call it this fire has happened now why this fire happened and in order that we avoid such a thing in the future I will investigate later and we'll try to see where the loopholes were why this thing happened in the first place but for now is beyond my control the fire brigade is doing its job there's nothing I can do by standing here and just looking at the flames and lamenting and mourning over the whole thing why should I disrupt my daily spiritual routine because of something like this which is beyond my control there's nothing I can contribute by just standing here and being a passive bystander or an onlooker here so why not use my time gainfully just go back do my routine within an hour or two I'll be free I'll come back and then deal with the problem in any case what's happened has happened so such a stark contrast it's not easy for someone to think like that but here was a person by dint of his spiritual practice had cultivated a sense of detachment 
having understood clearly that in life hard work intelligence etc are not the all in all these are not the only formulae for success although hard work and intelligence do matter capability does matter attitude does matter but still there are forces beyond our control inexplicable forces that forcefully sometimes come into our life and determine our destiny so he understood very well that this was something that he had not thought about not anticipated it had come of its own accord and he had to take it in his stride <clears throat> our ancient books say that happiness and distress or at least the external manifestations or those external things that stimulate happiness and distress within our minds they come very often of their own accord uninvited distress always comes uninvited <laughs> of course we act in such a way as to invite distress unknowingly but sometimes the distress comes of its own accord like it did for that gentleman one fine day his whole business was up in flames so he didn't want that to happen distress is like that it just walks into our life like a bad uninvited guest and who parks himself or herself in a house and doesn't want to leave but eventually they leave so similarly distress comes and distress will go of its own accord similarly just as distress comes and goes of its own accord so will happiness so the ancient sages have said why should you pursue the pleasures of this world to the neglect of some higher and truer happiness which is your birthright your prerogative to pursue the pleasures and pains of this world are flickering they come they go and just like the winter and summer seasons they come and they go so that's the law of nature similarly the happiness and distress comes and goes of its own accord so a person who wants to achieve complete transcendence to transcend this happiness and distress has to uh, has to think about the situation of the mind because it's all here it's all in the mind and when i say it's all here and i point a finger i'm not referring to the brain the brain is the physical organ through which the mind and intelligence act but the brain is not the mind the brain is not the intelligence the brain is merely the physical instrumentality through which these subtle functions manifest themselves so the mind is something very subtle so is the intelligence today psychologists and neuroscientists grapple with this idea of what the mind is what intelligence is what consciousness is and very often they come to some reductionist conclusions for example that intelligence resides or reposes itself in some part of the brain there are different types of intelligence and one part of the brain is responsible for one kind of intelligence another part of the brain for another kind of intelligence or when it comes to emotions and feelings the one part of the brain is responsible for one type of emotion and so on so everything is being looked at in terms of the physical body and the brain is a part of the physical body however there is another aspect to our existence which goes beyond the physical body today's knowledge today's science considers even the mind and the intelligence and the consciousness to be byproducts of that physical body the brain the nervous system and so on but our ancient books of wisdom say otherwise while not discounting the importance of the physical body they take us to a higher platform of understanding that we are actually spiritual entities we are not matter 
and the Sanskrit word for it is Atma which is loosely translated in English as the soul but the word soul is quite confusing because it has so many connotations and different people understand this word differently but the word soul actually refers to something spiritual something superior to matter matter is destructible the forms of matter are always changing but spirit is never changing spirit is eternal spirit sustains it survives even the destruction of this body the soul has with it accompanying it from life to life and yes there is such a thing as a previous life and a next life there is such a thing as a continuity and life or consciousness is a continuum in which our experiences are moved from life to life to life the soul moves on from one destination from one experience in one body to another and another and another and the mind and the intelligence which constitute the subtle body as opposed to the gross body act as a vehicle to transport the soul from one gross body to another the mind and intelligence are also material but they are very subtle the physical body which we leave behind at the time of death is a, is the gross manifestation of the body so we have the gross body we have the subtle body the mind and intelligence are very very fine and they constitute the subtle body the mind is the repository of all our desires our thoughts our emotions our feelings the intelligence is the faculty that is responsible for decision making for discrimination for making choices and there is a battle sometimes between the mind and the intelligence the intelligence tells you don't eat that sugar that's you're going to put on weight but the mind says no go for it go for it and then you struggle the mind and the intelligence have a tug of war and whoever is stronger at that part of the day you know is going to prevail and you either succumb to the temptation and go for that cake or you just say no i better not do it hmm? so the mind and the intelligence they have this difference the mind desires so if we train our mind to become calm and peaceful to be satisfied then we must have to train we must train our intelligence to do the same the analogy is a beautiful analogy given of a chariot you have horses that pull a chariot then you have a chariot driver and the chariot driver has reins with which he holds the horses and controls them and eggs them on to move then there is the chariot and there is the passenger within the chariot so the horses represent the senses of our body the gross body we have eyes ears the nose the tongue the skin these are called the knowledge acquiring senses the senses with which or through which we interact with the world outside through which we acquire knowledge information of the world they're very important for us and what we see around are the sense objects there is sight or there is form there is smell sound touch taste so the senses are seeking gratification in the objects of the senses so the senses are constantly pursuing the tantalizing display of sense objects that this world presents before us and therefore when we go to the shopping mall we look at all these attractive objects and we invariably come away buying something that we probably didn't intend to buy when we entered we get attracted so the senses are being constantly attracted to the sense objects so the horses are pursuing their objects of gratification but the point is that they're all moving in an uncontrolled way the chariot driver represents the intelligence 
The intelligence is meant to control the senses. When the senses eat that cake, the intelligence says, no, 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 don't do that. Not good for you. You worked hard to control your weight all these days. Don't spoil it just by this one urge. So the intelligence controls the senses through the reins. The reins represent the mind. So if the chariot driver holds the reins properly, knows how to pull the reins properly, when to release it, when to tighten it, and how to do that, then the intelligence controls the mind, which in turn controls the senses, and then that leads to peace. One experiences a peaceful situation in life because now the mind is being controlled by the intelligence. And what's behind? Who is the passenger? The chariot represents the body, the physical body, and the passenger represents the soul. The soul has a need, just as a body has a need, our stomach has a need. We have physical needs for sleep, for food, etc. We have mental needs, emotional needs. We have many types of needs. And the world is busy trying to make arrangements for the fulfillment of these needs. However, what about the need of the soul? We are spiritual beings, spiritual entities, and we are neglectful of the most fundamental need, which is the need of the soul, the spiritual needs. When we heed our spiritual voice, when we consider our spiritual needs as being something very primary in our life, then slowly we start looking for means to get this knowledge. What is this spirituality about? What is this way by which I can attain lasting peace and happiness? Whereby my perception of the outside world will become very equipoised, where I will attain the state of equanimity. Because you see, as we all know, we can't control the world. We can't control the external circumstances into which we find ourselves. At least often we can't. Very often we can, but sometimes we can't. So how can one live within this turbulent world, which is full of expected and unexpected calamities and difficulties and challenges? Expecting a world which will be entirely peaceful, which will not annoy us or irritate us, is a utopia that's not possible. The external world will present innumerable reasons that will annoy us and irritate us every day. So that's the nature of this world. So then the science of happiness is a science of acquiring spiritual understanding, understanding knowledge of our own identity as spiritual particles of energy, of strengthening and nourishing our intelligence with spiritual knowledge, and using that spiritual knowledge to perform certain spiritual practices by instructing the mind and the senses. And then the chariot of the body, mind, intelligence and soul moves ahead very smoothly in life. So it's a question of our perception. In the same, in the one of the wisdom books called the Srimad Bhagavatam, there is the interesting tale of another merchant who was very wealthy, but he also happened to be rather stingy. He would never share his wealth with anyone, even his family members. So his family members became very annoyed with him. And there were constant arguments in the house. One day, or rather over a, over a period of time, one by one he started losing everything. And at the end of that period of time, he was deprived of all his wealth. Then his business associates rejected him. His family members rejected him. He was left uh, all by himself. And then as he reflected on his condition, he became very philosophical. 
And there's a beautiful song that he sung, a song of many nice verses. It's a long song, I, I don't have the time to explain that. But he concluded, after analyzing the world around him, he was trying to analyze the cause of his pain, of his distress. And he said, actually, the cause of distress are not my customers, they're not my suppliers, they're, they're not my employees, then it's not destiny either, it's not even my karma, it's not the stars and the planets in my astrological chart, it's not this and it's not that, but there's only one source of my pain and that's my mind. So he came to this very sublime conclusion that happiness and distress are not phenomena of the outside world. One time when I was in England, they asked me to speak on a topic called happiness is an inside job. <laughs> that was a very cleverly worded topic. So I congratulated the person who, who thought of that topic. Yeah, it's a nice, it's actually true. Happiness is an inside job. It's not something that is dependent on the external uh, things of this world or even on external people. Although naturally they have an impact on us. But at the end of the day, it's how we manage our mind. The mind is extremely restless, very turbulent, very obstinate. And as Shraddha mentioned, how many thoughts did you say? 80,000 thoughts a day, yes? So psychologists say that we have as many as 80,000 thoughts in a day. Now that's quite a number. And if you consider how many hours you sleep and take the hours where you're in the wakeful state and you do a little mathematics, then you'll come to a conclusion that there's practically one thought a second or maybe one thought in one and a half or two seconds. That's the number of thoughts that go through our mind every day. Just imagine, it's like a constant assault. Our mind is being flooded with these thoughts one after the other. Ever since this lecture began, your mind has gone through so many thoughts. <coughs> Isn't it? You've thought not just of the things I'm saying, but you've thought of many other things. And it's natural. Every one of us go through, goes through this. We have to go through this entire cycle. And these thoughts just emerge on the surface of the mind, what we call today as the conscious mind. Like bubbles that emerge from the ocean and then come onto the surface and burst and disappear. So for no reason these thoughts come out. Randomly, they come up on the surface and they keep on tormenting us. They keep on harassing us, the one after the other, one after the other, sometimes for no good reason, these thoughts emerge. And we have to deal with them. Sometimes we don't even realize why we are becoming depressed or feel bad about something. There are days when we wake up feeling very nice. There are days when we wake up and we don't know why we are feeling a little down. We can't seem to find a rational reason for it. That's the way the mind is. I want to introduce before you another Sanskrit word which is called samskar. Samskar means in loose language impressions. The impressions on the mind. And there's another word I want to introduce, now, I promise, the last one. Vritti. Vritti means a thought, an emotion or a sensation. So you have a thought or an emotion or a sensation that comes up in your mind. In the ocean of your consciousness, your conscious awareness, which is called mindfulness. What is mindfulness? Mindfulness is simply the state of being aware or conscious of your situation. So in your ocean of consciousness, you have these emotions or these thoughts or these desires that come up according to your plan or perhaps not according to your plan. They just emerge. 
and then we respond to each thought, sensation or emotion. The response that we offer is called a samskar. It creates an impression in our mind. And then that impression is not just a latent passive impression. It's like a groove in a gramophone record. Because nowadays, only those who are older will remember what a gramophone record is. Yeah, but you know, you had the good old days where you had a round gramophone record that went round and round, and you had this little stylus that touched it, and the moment it touched the groove, then the, the music began, and they went round and round. So, these samskars are like pathways in our consciousness, in our mind. They're like grooves. And when these uh, vrittis or these stimuli, they come again into our life, there's already a groove there. So the stylus touches that and something comes out. There's another response. So the more and more we do something like that, the more that samskar or that impression becomes intensified and becomes stronger. And the next time, even without a stimulus, the thought itself will, will provoke us to do that action again and again. Let me explain it in a very simple way. Let's take a, an example that's not very pleasant, but it's very illustrative. The example of a thief. Now, a thief starts stealing. Perhaps there's some compulsion to do it, or whatever be the reason. Now he performs an act that's not good, he does it, maybe he feels guilty about it, but he's done it. Once he's done it, there are two reactions to it. There are two things that happen. One, in all likelihood, he's caught. And then he's punished. The second reaction that happens is more subtle. That's in his own mind. That act of stealing something has created a groove in his consciousness. It's made an impression. Now, the next time he's confronted with a temptation where he feels that something, I, I could steal something, he has the option. But now he deliberates, oh, I was punished. I had a bad experience. I shouldn't steal. So he's able to refrain from that temptation or that tendency to steal. So he holds back. But then it's hard. Another time it's more tempting. He gives in. He steals again. Now that impression has become stronger. And the next time around, his resistance to a temptation to steal will go down that one notch lower. And then he steals again. It becomes stronger. And then stronger. And stronger. Till it becomes irresistible. The case, same case with, let's say, an alcoholic, someone who is completely a victim to uh, alcoholism or to anything. Actually, we are all victims of habit. 90% of everything we do in our life is dictated by force of habit. Whether it's waking up at a certain time in the morning, whether it's making our beds the first thing in the morning or leaving it untidy for the rest of the day, Every little thing and big thing in our life is dictated by habit which comes out of the um, samskaras, the impressions in our mind which force us to act in certain ways. So therefore, if you want to change our destiny, we want to change the future, we want to control our lives in the state of our mind and eventually become peaceful, then we have to focus on what kind of habits, what kind of lifestyles, what kind of attitudes we want to cultivate as we move on. I mentioned earlier some examples of how people respond differently to identical situations. There's another story I want to tell you, a true story, about twins. One of them became a criminal and the other became a very noble human being. 
he was appreciated in the society and people loved him because he was he did good to everybody he was selfless he always cared for others he helped others but his twin was exactly the opposite and he was arrested eventually and put in jail and then one reporter tried to do some research and she approached the twin separately she approached the one who was a criminal and she asked him you know you you are a, you you take into a life of crime and you're in jail and your twin he's got such a good reputation in the society so why did you become a criminal so he said you know when i was small my father was an alcoholic he used to come home he used to beat my mother he used to beat me we had no money so he had he went through a very very troubled childhood so this was the only recourse i had and i wanted to make sure that i don't end up you know being poor so i took to a life of crime so she, the reporter went to the other twin so how come your twin you know is a criminal but you became a good person what happened you had the same childhood the same troubled experiences from childhood the same father the same mother the same poverty the same everything he said i wanted to ensure that what i went through you know should not happen to anyone else and i wanted to see what my father did to me i would not do to my children and i wanted to make sure that i would do good to others now so therefore i took i i embarked on this path of of helping other people of sacrificing myself to work for others welfare so here you had twins but just see the different reactions the responses psychologists today have an interesting take they say that there are certain factors that shape our personality one of the factors is of course our nature which comes from inheritance our hereditary nature which they call genetics by genetics we inherit a certain part of our personality or our nature that accounts for roughly 50% of who we are so you're born with a certain trait or a certain characteristic a certain nature a certain personality so what we are today 50% of that comes from our nature which we were born with 10% they say is dependent on what your environment uh how your environment impacts you so your your surroundings shape your personality and your thoughts and so on but 40% is up to us it's our free will how we respond to the environment how we respond to our conditioning that is born out of our genetic makeup so that's the 40% which we work on to control the mind if we use our free will properly to get into the right kind of company spiritual company company where we hear noble uh, ideas where we hear of topics that are beyond the mundane where we train ourselves to think differently to act differently then gradually we raise ourselves to a higher platform we will actually be able to be mindful of our situation the more we move into that realm in spiritual language it's called the mode of goodness as opposed to other modes like the mode of passion or the mode of ignorance in the mode of goodness one becomes more sensitive to one's environment to one's situation one becomes more amenable to the cultivation of spiritual knowledge the mode of goodness is cultivated by simple things like sleeping early at night waking up early in the morning being clean tidy keeping your house clean being neat keeping things in the proper place making your bed the first thing in the morning when you wake up taking a bath the first thing when you wake up avoiding habits 
that are destructive, that are not conducive to development of a peaceful heart, avoiding violence and cruelty to other living entities, leading a life where one has time for contemplation, one has time to go and the inclination to go and associate with people to hear spiritual topics, to reflect on them, discuss, perhaps take to some spiritual practices, to avoid diets that are also conducive to compassion, to be kind. And when one follows this, gradually one sees a change in one's mind. One's mind becomes more sensitive. Our capacity to focus, to be mindful, to concentrate is very significantly enhanced. We see a certain subtleness and fineness coming into the way we look at life. And when we actually seriously start practicing certain spiritual methods, then these things become even more refined. And we start feeling ourselves becoming insulated from the trials and tribulations of the world. We develop an inner sense of peace which will keep us protected even when the world around us becomes very turbulent. There are so many types of spiritual practices that can be done. Meditative practices are essential. However, blank meditation, which seems to be getting very popular these days, may have a temporary effect for some time. But devoid of spiritual understanding, spiritual knowledge, and devoid of a higher, larger, deeper spiritual goal, such mundane meditative practices are not very fruitful in the long run. And ultimately, they don't lead us to a higher destination. But meditative practices that are based upon sound spiritual understanding, understanding of spiritual concepts like the existence of the spiritual soul, the existence of karma, you know, the science of action, the science of work. Unless we are equipped with the understanding of such concepts, our meditative practices will not be sufficiently fruitful. So when one experiences, when one uh, uh, tries to gather knowledge of this sort, understanding these concept, concepts of the previous life, the next life, the soul, karma, yoga, yes, all these different terms which people are familiar with nowadays, but they need to be pursued in a deeper way. Then one actually comes to the point of attaining real peace real happiness. We as spiritual beings are not meant to be here in this world of matter. We are meant to be in a higher dimension of existence which is a spiritual realm. We are like refugees here. And we are not meant to be here. It's a very incompatible situation for the spiritual entity to be in a material atmosphere. By practicing meditative spiritual practices, we rise beyond the material realm and when the time of death comes, we will ascend to a realm, to a dimension of spiritual reality from which there is no coming back. That is a realm of immortality, the realm where there is no death, no birth, no disease, no old age, no income tax, no problems at all. It's a life of bliss, of joy. So it's not peace that we are after. We are after bliss. The bliss that is far beyond any conception of happiness that we may ordinarily have in this world. So meditation is best done through sound vibration in this age. It's called mantra meditation. The word mantra, I'm sure you've all heard the word. The word mantra has two parts, mana and tra. Mana means the mind. 
Mitra comes from another word which indicates relief from or to deliver from. So mantra is that which delivers the mind from anxiety, which grants peace and serenity and joy to the mind. So there are many mantras that we have. And there are various types of mantras and we follow a particular type from the tradition which I come and I will share that mantra with you it's called Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare these are spiritual sounds when you focus on the sound vibration and you hear these sounds very carefully they gradually create a certain uh, joy in the heart they destroy all the other anxieties and all the other negativities in the heart and they bring out our original spiritual nature by nature originally we are blissful but we have forgotten that so the original blissful nature of the soul is once again invoked so by chant by doing the mantra meditation we are not in any way imposing anything artificial on the consciousness rather we are simply bringing out what is already within we are bringing out the natural constitutional position of the soul and this is something that goes beyond any mundane sectarian differences whatever be the ethnicity the nationality the culture the creed whatever else gender it doesn't depend on that even animals can benefit even birds and plants can benefit i have a fellow brother of mine who goes into the forest to do this mantra meditation because he wants to help the plants in the forest yeah serious he does that he sits amongst the trees and the plants because he, he feels that they will get benefited in the next life they will be able to continue their spiritual journey so this is a very beautiful and sublime science to give us a permanent solution so that the mind can be completely at rest and at peace and experience a higher joy despite the challenges of the modern times so this is a brief message that I came here to give you this evening. I'm very thankful you listened with such a peaceful heart and peaceful mind. I'll stop here and do we have time for questions? Okay, so I would invite any questions that you may have. Feel free to ask. Just raise your hand and I'll try to answer your questions. Got a microphone for anyone who's quite interested, so we can all hear it. Um, but that's not to intimidate anyone. Nobody else. Yeah. What does Hare Krishna actually mean? Hare Krishna, Hare and Krishna are two spiritual words. Krishna refers to the one, the source of everything, who is all attractive. All attraction emanates from this one supreme source. The one supreme source is not something sectarian. The source, the emanation for, of everything, everything and anything, living, non-living, everything emanates from something. That entity we call Krishna, the all attractive personality. Hare refers to the energy of that entity we also have a personality and we have energy you know so we act through our assistants through our friends we have a car we have move so we have energy we have money with which we can do things so this entity has innumerable energies so the combination of the supreme source with the with the multitude of energies that constitutes the entire existence. That is what Hare Krishna actually means. And when you delve deeper, then, then actually understand the nature of that all-attractive entity. 
it's, it's not something that is the monopoly of a particular group of people or a particular sect. It's something that transcends all that. The divisions that are created today are man-made and they cause so much conflict, which is why people actually are put off these days uh, by any such mention. But these things uh, have nothing to do with the divisions uh, that we as humans have made. The supreme absolute source of everything will always remain regardless of what we quarrel about or what we differ with each other about. Everything has a source. Nothing comes from nothing. Everything comes from something. And that something must come from something. And the ultimate source of, that, of everything is that supreme, unlimited source of everything, all attractive. Okay? You had a question too? I'm just wondering. Yes, yeah, so just so everyone can hear. Enough. Yeah. Um, I was lucky enough to have been to the sect of India and done some of the mantra meditation. But so I'm sitting at home on my chair and I want to meditate. So I just can I say the words in my head? Is it better to say them out loud? Is five minutes long enough to make a difference or? Yeah. So, how do you go about doing this at home or wherever you want to meditate? Okay, so how do you go about uh, doing this mantra meditation? Do you do it softly or, or do you do it in the mind or do you chant it aloud? You can do it in all three ways. There is mantra meditation possible in the mind. It's possible by doing it softly. It's also possible by doing it aloud. However, because in this day and age, our minds are weak. Our minds are very restless and agitated. The minds are incapable of focusing for very long on anything. Therefore, for this age, it is recommended that we do our mantra meditation a little loudly. Little loudly, I mean loud enough for you to hear yourself. So you, you could even say it softly, but it should be loud enough that you can even hear externally. And when you do that and concentrate on the sound, on hearing the sound, and you lock your mind, so to speak, between the tongue and the ear, that meditation will be very potent, very powerful. And, and are you going to do five minutes first this evening before we go home? Okay, yes, why not? What do you think? <laughs> sure. All right, we will. Any other questions? Thanks for all the knowledge today. Thank uh, you. I was wondering if you could uh, comment about um, the effects of food on the mind. So what we eat and how it affects the mind and the state of the mind and the thoughts. Um, thank you. Very, very important question. And, and one thing I just yeah. always had in mind was uh, the rate of the number of thoughts per minute in your mind and if food affects that. The, the rate of? Like how many thoughts per minute. Oh, I see. And okay. The food affects that as well. Okay. Will the food affect the number of thoughts going on in the mind? Okay. You've heard the proverb, probably, you are what you eat. <laughs> Truly, you are. In more ways than we can imagine, we are what we eat. Because ultimately, our body is made up of the food that we consume. So we are conceived in the womb of our mother, and the mother's body supplies nutrients by which our, our body grows within her womb. And then we grow and then we are born, we emerge into this world outside our mother's body and then our body subsists on food that we eat ourselves. So the body, the physical body compri is comprised of the food that we eat. Of course there are other things like the air we breathe and so on, but primarily it's the food that we eat. Now, it's not just the physical body 
that is constructed of the food that we eat. The fact that food makes the physical body is something we all are aware of. It's just common knowledge. Everybody knows it. But the fact that the food also makes up your mind is something that not many people are well aware of. The subtle essence, it's, it's a complicated, it's a bit large topic and I don't have the time to go into the details of it. One could speak at length on it. There are books called the Upanishads in Sanskrit and ancient that give us a whole detailed sequence of how the food is transformed eventually into your mind. The different types of food and how they eventually transform into your mind. Because mind is a subtle essence of the food. That's the summary of it. So the food that you take into the body gets assimilated and one part of it, the gross part of the food, is assimilated and it strengthens your body and it turns into nutrients and so on. And if it's not digested, it becomes toxic. So according to Ayurveda, the food, you know, what you eat is not food. By the way, it's an important idea to know. What you eat is not food, what you digest is food. Because everything you eat is not digested properly. And therefore the kind of food we eat is important because we must eat food that is digestible to us, that is meant for the human system to eat and to digest. So the food that is not digested becomes toxin. It's like poison in the body. And that's the root of all diseases, according to Ayurveda. So when you go to an Ayurvedic physician, the first thing the physician will look at is your stomach. <laughs> because the stomach is the root of health, good or bad. So if your digestion is going on properly, then you'll be healthy. So therefore there's a saying, know your food, and you'll be healthy. So there's no need to take medicine. So if you know your food, then there's no need to take medicine. If you don't know your food, there's still no need to take medicine. Because it won't help. <laughs> because if you're not eating right, you don't know your body right, you don't know the types of food right, then no matter what medicine you take, it's not going to work. So the crux, the best medicine is food and that kind of food that not only nourishes your body and makes it stronger, makes it able to sustain and, and resist Im and have immunity from diseases and so on, but also you have to have take, take food who, the subtle essence of which will make up your mind, peaceful mind. So foods that are in the mode of ignorance will destabilize the body. They create a lot of toxins because they're not easily, easily digestible, like meat, etc. And they also create a disturbed mind. So the gross part of the food creates toxin. The subtle part of the food disturbs the mind. Likewise with the foods in the mode of passion. Foods in the mode of goodness they actually nourish the body and they nourish the mind. So they are more conducive towards a peaceful mind and a healthy body. So foods in the mode of goodness should be consumed by those who are desirous of a peaceful life. Foods in the mode of goodness are primarily vegetarian foods. And even if vegetarian, not very spicy. I come from a land where they love spices <laughs> and so sometimes that you know it's burning you, you you're like a dragon burning fire but sometimes you eat some of them that's called food in the mode of passion it just makes you all worked up and everything get angry food in the mode of goodness calms you down so it makes your mind so the subtle essence of that your mind is constituted of the subtle essence of the food that you take. So your thoughts, your desires, your inclinations, your attitudes, 
are very largely determined by the food you eat. So coming to the last part of your question about whether the number of thoughts may reduce, yes, it may be so, it will be so rather, because you will find yourself able to focus your mind longer on whatever it is that you're doing at the moment. Let's say someone's a student and is, is preparing, studying a textbook, you know, preparing for the examination. One of the most common questions I have students, students ask me, yeah, because I spend a lot of time at universities as well, you know, I can't concentrate, I'm not able to remember my things, I read the book and my mind wanders and I put it aside, I do something else, you know. That's because they're so restless, the mind just is not able to focus on anything. They read one line, the mind goes somewhere, then they pick up a phone, do something else, the, you know, talk, do something else. They just can't focus. So when your food is in the mode of goodness, you will find your capacity to focus gets enhanced. So to that degree, the number of thoughts that will race through your minds may reduce. Okay, any other questions? Yes, yeah, yeah okay. All right, okay, yeah, one question there. I was wondering whether you could um, uh, perhaps give us an um, insight to, I think you did an engineering degree, um, what, what, your, your education and what transitioned you to where you are today, and what were those things, because it's obviously not the typical. <laughs> okay, I told Shraddha to cut that part out from my introduction. <laughs> But Shraddha, what to do? Maybe your desire to read it out was stronger, so this question was asked. <laughs> Maybe she just wanted all of you to know it, so <laughs> come. Yes, I, I did a bachelor's in electrical engineering. And then I did a postgraduate diploma in finance management, financial management. I worked for a brief while in a multinational bank in India and uh, then I gave it up to become a monk. That's more than 30 years ago. So it's like a previous life. Sometimes people ask me, do you have any regrets because you had a flourishing career and you were making a decent amount of money and everything like that. Do you have any regrets of taking to this life? And I say, yes, I have one regret. The regret is that I should have come earlier. <laughs> there was no need to have gone through this whole thing of sitting there with pound, shillings, pence or, or dollars and cents and, and dealing with all of that. But anyway, I guess we all have to go through our journeys according to our past lives we come into a certain state of mind we we come into a certain there is an, an evolution that takes place over lives and perhaps that was to be so i had to go through that and perhaps that's also good because it opens the mind broadens the mind gives us an awareness of the world in which we are living so one is not completely unaware of you know one is not naive one is aware of the world in which one lives and therefore is able to deal with the world because one has had experience with it. So what, what motivated me to do this is because I came across some books, the Bhagavad Gita basically, which is one of the primary spiritual texts of ancient India. I met people who were practicing this very seriously and it inspired me tremendously. It answered questions for me. As a student, I was very interested in astronomy. I was an amateur astronomer, and I was the editor of our university, Astronomy Society. Astronomy Society. I had to write articles, <coughs> go for these observatories and look at things, night. We were nocturnal creatures. And so we would ponder, but what's the reason? What's, where's all this coming from? 
and my friends would probably think I was a little weird because they were into partying and they were into you know everything else that university students do and but I wasn't interested in that I maybe sometimes but mostly looking at you know what's all this but modern science didn't satisfy me it didn't give the answers <clears throat> But when I read Bhagavad Gita, I got the answers. It made so much more sense. So then I took to this process and not looked back since then. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> this is the first time I'm speaking about this at length in any public program <laughs> in 30 years. <laughs> it's only because you asked. Any other questions? Okay, yeah, Mike, please. Yeah, <coughs> yeah, right here, right in the front, first back, right here. Where is your belief in reincarnation source from? Uh, I suppose, uh, why? The idea basically comes from the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads and the Vedic scriptures which are a treasure house of knowledge, mind-boggling, amazing knowledge in every sphere of life. That is what struck me like a thunderbolt when I came across this because I was very much into science and all of those things but when I saw this I was a skeptic but when I started deliberating on these ideas uh, I realized how much sense it made and it's not just because it's written in a book but the kind of logic that goes with it is very sublime so reincarnation is a law of nature when you, when you bring in this concept, this idea of a previous life, a current life and the next life and a continuum of lives, it explains so many phenomena that we see in the world but we are unable to satisfactorily explain. Let me just give you one of them because it's a topic in itself and it could be a lecture in itself. Um, consider for example why there are people, are children born, let's say, mentally challenged or physically deformed and some are born with a very high IQ, some are born with natural physical beauty, some are born with a certain kind of uh, ability that is extraordinary, others don't have it. Why do we see this kind of enormous diversity, even disparity, around us and people. Why are we so different from each other? Why are your skills so different from mine? Why do you like things so differently from what I do? These are fundamental questions and science simply brushes it away by genetics, by the one word genetics, genes. It's there in your genes, that's it. But why? Why is it there in my genes? Why is it that this child is born like this and that child is born like that. And we explain it away. This has, this has been one of the deepest questions that have um, the philosophers and scientists have been grappling with, but they haven't found an answer. It is only when we understand, number one, the concept of our identity as eternal spirit souls, number one. Number two, that this eternal soul had a body earlier and will have a body again in the next life, the continuum of that, that is reincarnation. And thirdly, that there is the concept of karma, action and reaction, which determines what kind of body or what kind of situation that soul will obtain in a later life. When you understand these three concepts, there are many more, but fundamentally at least these three, that everything begins to make so much sense. Everything falls into place. Then it's just 
you may not know the specifics of everything but you understand the general principles according to which this world is functioning the whole world otherwise is just a bizarre place it, things don't make sense why are things happening the way they are you know why do bad things happen to good people why do good things happen to bad people and we have all these conundrums philosophical conundrums which we don't have answers to but when we reflect on these ideas everything just falls into place so it's actually quite logical as well okay any questions makes sense i think so i think yeah you just um Oh, that's a sort of fundamental question. I can do to add a lot of prior knowledge and study on you about the right. Senate for I think you did like a couple of days to explain it properly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, something, fo food for thought. <laughs> food for thought, yeah? Yeah, thank you. Okay. <coughs> One final question, if anyone has it. Okay, yeah. As you just mentioned that um, our um, soul of the eternal being on him. Yes. When does it stop doing it? What does our soul need to do in every life to stop coming back to this earth and stay where it's supposed to be? Right. Yes, and that is um, exactly what I was trying to, co uh, to conclude with. That when we take to spiritual processes, specifically mantra meditation assisted by various other spiritual techniques one rises beyond matter and gradually when one attains spiritual perfection then one is released from the cycle of birth and death then one attains to that spiritual dimension then there is no more birth no more death so this, otherwise, we are stuck in the cycle. It's like a Ferris wheel that goes round and round and round. The soul has to go through all these different species of life. We've been there, done that. We've, we've been in animal bodies, we've been plants, we've been insects, we've been all sorts of things. We've been humans before. Maybe we were kings and queens in some life as well. So really been there, done that. Just about anything and everything in life, in this world, is to be done, we've done it. So now we say, all right, enough. Now <laughs> let's, let's go beyond this. Let's think of something that is really going to give us happiness eternally, give us immortality eternally. That comes by following these spiritual practices. Then we cut that for good, cut this link. That's the root cause of our suffering, getting this material body again and again. Because this material body is designed for distress, programmed for that. Then the soul is released from that cycle. Hmm. Okay, and since our friend here, what's your name? Cindy. 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 So since Cindy was asking about some meditation, what you wanted us to do a little bit of meditation, so what do you say? We have a few minutes of, of mantra chanting. Okay, we'll chant this. I'll, I'll do it a little musically. It's okay with you? And I'll, I'll sing. And after I finish, then you sing after me. How's that? Good? Okay. We'll chant the same mantra that I was saying. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama Rama, Rama Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare 
हरे राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे एवरीबॉडी प्लीज लिटल लाउडर कृष्ण हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्ण हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे last time hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 ram hare ram 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 hare 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 krishna hare krishna 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 hare Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Thank you very much Thank you So how was that Cindy Wonderful Good <laughs> Okay so thank you all very much you've been a wonderful audience and I hope I've given you some food for thought and thank you Shraddha and Sen for having organized this program and for having invited me thank you hare krishna